Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Rotonda Tomori, self-proclaimed Makarara Avenda. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and I really hope that you guys enjoy this video and if you do, please like, subscribe and turn on your post notifications so you know when I post. But anyway, let's get into today's case. So today we're going to be talking about a woman who went by the name of Marlene Lenberg. Marlene Lindbergh was born on the 15th of October in 1955. Marlene grew up in a very strict household. Her dad was known to be a very strict man of the house. He didn't really accept any disrespectful or unjustified behavior from his children. He was also known to not express any affection to his children. So he never made his children feel like, oh my God, my dad loves me so much. They never felt that because he never, he probably didn't grow up that way, like feeling affection from his parents. So he obviously didn't raise his children feeling affection from him. So her home was so strict that she wasn't allowed to socialize when she was younger. She wasn't allowed to go out with friends. She had actually never been to a cinema in her whole high school career because she wasn't allowed to go out. All she was allowed to do was to wake up, go to school, and come home and study. It was, no, I'm going to go see my friend, no, I want to sleep over. It was none of that, and it was never allowed. She was actually a very, very smart young girl. She was so intelligent. She always came first in her classes. She was never known to even think about or talk about boys. She only focused on school and she was pretty naive because she didn't have any experience and she didn't really have friends to tell her about what they experienced. So she was quite naive and she was very innocent as well. In February of 1972, this was when she began her first job. Her first job was a clerical assistant and receptionist for the Red Cross Children's Hospital in Rondebosch, Cape Town. This is when she started working in the orthopedic section, a workshop, with a man by the name of Christian van der Linde. So Christian was the chief technician of this workshop. And Marlene was a young, attractive 16-year-old girl who apparently found a connection and drew close to him from the very beginning of this workshop. So at first she says that she grew close to him because she felt like he was a father figure different from her own father because he was more warm hearted and more welcoming. She even recalled a moment when he said welcome and her heart started to beat faster. But somehow this father-daughter dynamic that they had quickly transformed into something else. So by 1973 in April, a year after they had met, they started having an affair. I don't know how this was working because Marlene was 17 probably by this time. And for someone who is a chief technician, he was definitely not under 18 he was probably a lot older than what i could even think but his age and when he was born and all that information wasn't in any of the things that i tried to find so the rest of the year following the the beginning of their relationship in 1973 they would start meeting in private locations and they would also meet a lot in the Rondebosch Common. So then early in 1974, their relationship stopped. And this was because Christian said that he felt like he was being watched and followed. He believed that they were being watched because he, his wife started receiving anonymous telephone calls all the time. And he believed that the secret telephone calls were to reveal the secret relationship that he had with Marlene. So even though Christian had explained multiple times to Marlene that he would never ever leave his wife and family, for some reason, 
Marlene believed that the only obstacle that was standing in the way of her and Christian's relationship becoming a permanent situation was his wife. And her name was Susanna. So her believing that Susanna was in the way of their relationship becoming permanent, even though she was like 17 years old. So by July of 1974, she started getting really frustrated with the fact that Christian was choosing to end their relationship, I guess, instead of ending his relationship with his wife, even though he did tell her that he would never leave his wife. So this is when she started getting more and more frustrated with the situation and she, and she decided that she wanted to leave Cape Town. But for some reason, Christian didn't want her to leave Cape Town, even though he didn't want to leave his wife, and he convinced her to not leave and to stay. So growing even more irritated with the situation, this was when she decided that she wanted to confront Susanna, as if Susanna wasn't his whole wife. This was when she contacted Susanna, and she told Susanna that she and Christian were very much in love and they see each other every single night. And she wanted to know what Susanna was planning on doing with this new information that her husband was cheating on her. But instead, Susanna just hung up the phone. So a few weeks later, after this abrupt conversation, she called Susanna again, who had just pretty much probably ignored the situation. I don't understand how, but she called her again, and this time they made an appointment to meet up. This was when they met in an area called Belleville in October of 1974. So when they met up, Marlene was hoping that they would come to some sort of agreement, as in she was probably hoping that Susanna would want to divorce Christian, but instead Susanna told her that she would never ever leave Christian for the sake of their children and she didn't care if they were having some sort of extramarital affair. So Susanna also added after explaining that she would never leave her husband that she didn't care if Marlene was Christian's pretty much side chick as long as Marlene didn't mind and this was how their conversation pretty much ended and this is when Marlene saw that Susanna was not gonna plan on losing her husband to another woman ever so it was around this time after this conversation that Marlene met up with a man by the name of Martinez who had actually lost one of his legs in a motorcycle accident. He had actually come to the orthopedic workshop to try and get an artificial leg fitted for him. So Martinez was actually unemployed and disabled and his disabilities were both physical and mental and they had also affected his self-esteem. This had also made him very susceptible to Marlene's approaches and the reason why she was approaching him in the first place. So their first communication away from the orthopedic workshop and him trying to get a leg fitted was Marlene actually writing him a letter. So in this letter, she explained that if he was smart enough, he would be able to earn a lot of money from what she was about to ask him. And in the letter, she said that she wanted him to come to the orthopedic workshop. So when he came to this orthopedic workshop to see her, she gave him one rand and asked him to meet her at the, the Rondebosch town hall at 7 p.m. that evening. So when he arrived at this town hall, she gave him a bottle of gin and she explained why she had called him there. So when she explained what she wanted from him, she said that she wanted him to murder a woman for her. And at first he completely declined. He explained that he didn't want to end up in prison and why would he want to kill a woman that he didn't even know. But after some persuading from Marlene's side, 
he finally agreed to Marlene's request. So after this, Marlene gave him the address of where Susanna lives. And then a few weeks later, he went to the address. He claimed that when he went to this address, he actually wanted to warn Susanna about the fact that her life was in danger. But he ended up freezing when he, she opened the door because he did actually go there. He ended up freezing and he was too afraid to speak and he ended up just asking her for money. She explained that she didn't have any money and then she just closed the door on him and that was their conversation. So a week after him going to Susanna's house, he met up with Marlene again. And this was when he explained to Marlene that he was too afraid to commit this murder for her and he actually didn't want to do this. This was when she gave him a radio and promised that he, she would help him receive his artificial leg if he went through and committed this murder for her. So he took the radio and he left. And then a few days later, he went again to the area where Susanna stayed with her husband and children, obviously. And this time he didn't even go to the door or to the house. He just walked right past the house. And he didn't even try to enter or think of it because I feel like he really did not want to do this. So after she found out that he didn't go through with their plan again, this is when she sent him another letter. And in this letter, she was urging him to go and complete this murder and telling him that if he needed to, he should even use a knife. And then without his reply, she sent him another message and she told him to call her at work so when he did call her this is when she told him that he had to go through with this murder and that if he did that she would give him a car and also sleep with him at once this murder was completed so now nearing the end of october in 1974 this was when marlene actually handed in her resignation and she explained to christian that she was going to be leaving cape town so after she had resigned, she went to pick up Martinez at his home and they drove to where Susanna was staying. So he actually went with a hammer, which they wanted to use to kill Susanna. So she dropped him off close to Susanna's home and she sped away. So when he was there, probably festing up the carriage to go and do this task that he has been pretty much being forced to do. This is when Susanna actually spotted him and she started to get a little freaked out because she had seen him in the area more than once by this time now. So she actually called the police when she saw this and they actually came and they picked up martinez and they sent him away and he was just two blocks away from her house so when he got to the police station when they took him they actually beat him up and they told him to never return to susanna's area ever again so after martinez had failed for now the third time or so she decided that you know what she's going to take these matters into her own hands. So a few days after Martinez's arrest, Marlene went to a friend of hers whose name was Rob Newman. He was an engineer and she asked him if she could borrow his pistol. He refused and after he refused, this was when she asked him if he would kill someone for her. And obviously he refused again. And a few days after he had this conversation with Marlene, his pistol was stolen from his bedroom. He went and reported the theft and he also explained that he suspected that Marlene took it. So on the 4th of November in 1978, around 8.30am, Marlene showed up at Martinez's house. When she got there, she explained that she had packed up all her belongings and she was leaving for Johannesburg. Then she explained that before she left, she wanted him to come with her to Susanna's house. So on their way there, he says that while they were driving there, Marlene handed him the pistol that she had stolen from Rob. 
And this is when he realized that she was not just trying to say goodbye and she wanted him to finally do the job that she has been forcing him to do this whole time. So they arrived at the house around 9 o'clock in the morning and Susanna was alone in her home. And the accounts of what happened now are very different from what Marlene says happened and what Martina says happened. So according to Marlene, she says that she got to the house and she went with Martinez to the door she knocked on the door and she ran back to the car and then Martinez went inside and committed the crime but according to Martinez they went together to the door they knocked together they entered the house together and they committed the crime together so according to Martinez he's saying that they did this together but Marlene is saying, no, I only took him to the house and got him to the front door, but I didn't commit this murder. But she was probably just trying to stop herself from getting a worse sentence because there was actually a witness who corroborated what Martina was saying. So a neighbor that lived by Susanna's house actually confirmed so the witness explained that she had walked past Marlene's car twice in the span of 10 to 12 minutes and on both occasions the car was empty. So this proves that Marlene didn't knock on the door and run and wait in the car, that she had to have been inside with him because the car was empty. So Martinez explained that they knocked on the door and entered the house together and when Susanna saw them, she, be, she immediately started to freak out and threaten that she would call the police. She tried to get away from them to obviously call the police. And this is when she was tripped by Marlene. So after being tripped by Marlene, she fell and hit her head on the door. And this is when Marlene took the pistol. She hit her with the back of her pistol on her jaw. And then... On Marlene's instructions, Martina said that he began to strangle a semi-conscious Susanna. He said while he was doing this, this was when Marlene gave him a pair of scissors that she found on the sideboard. So Martina says that after he was handed these scissors, he remembers stabbing Susanna about three times but an autopsy report shows that there were seven stab wounds in her body and four of those stab wounds penetrated her chest. So after this crime was committed this was when Marlene she squirted green dye over Martinez using a gas pistol that Susanna had actually asked her husband to buy her after she saw Martinez around her area a few too many times and she started to get scared. Then Marlene told Martinez that she would deny every single part of this murder if he ever went to the police. And she was threatening him and so so that he wouldn't end up dying or losing his life as well. He agreed to not go to the police or say anything. And this is when she drove him back home. And then she left for Johannesburg, like she said. And she received two speeding tickets on her way to Johannesburg. So when Susanna's body was actually found, police said that when they brought in her husband to confirm if it was her, he casually moved her body with his foot to see her face. And he said... Yep, that's her, as if he was expecting and waiting for this to happen. The way that he said that it was her and the way that he was acting as if he was waiting for this day to come, police actually suspected that maybe he had actually influenced Marlene to murder his wife, but there was no proof to this, so he was never charged. So while police were investigating, they actually found Martinez and he had both of the pistols that were used, technically not used, in the crime. And when they asked him why didn't he try to get rid of them, he said that it was dangerous to throw away pistols. It was also mentioned that her body was actually found by her daughter 
when her husband was trying to get a hold of her the whole morning of her murder and he couldn't get a hold of her and he started getting worried and this is when he contacted his daughter her name was Zelda to go and find out what was happening with her mother and she says that when she got there the house was completely locked but she could see from a window her mother's body lying on the ground while police were investigating this murder they didn't know what to think of it or what happened and then this is when they decided that they wanted to talk to Marlene. So Marlene was actually staying at her uncle's house at this time in Bryanston. And police went to Marlene's house. And this was when they asked her to please accompany them back to their area. And while they were on their way there, this was when she admitted that she was having an affair with Christian, Susanna's husband. And that she was expecting the police to come and talk to her when she found out that Susanna was murdered. So when the police asked her if she had any association with a colored man by the name of Martinez, she denied it and said that she didn't know who that was. So after denying this, the police asked her if she asked Rob Newman to borrow his pistol and if she asked him to kill someone for her. She admitted that yes, she did, but she was just joking around with Newman that she didn't actually mean this. So even though they didn't have any evidence to prove that she was involved in any way, they just had a sneaking suspicion because she seemed very nervous when they were questioning her. So since they had a suspicion, they actually ended up arresting her for this crime and while she was waiting she actually ended up admitting to everything and she said that this is when she made her statement of waiting in the car and martinez actually being the one who entered the house and committed the crime but obviously this was later debunked and changed because of the witness who passed the car multiple times and saw that the car was empty so the trial of Marlene and Martinez actually began on the 5th of March in 1975. So this trial actually garnered a lot of attention. And during the trial, this is when they found they had over 30 witnesses to what had happened, including like what led up to the murder and the affair of Marlene and Christian. And after a long trial, this was when Marlene and Martinez were sentenced to death. So two months after the sentencing, they reopened the trial because of an appeal that was obviously approved. And this is when they set aside the death penalty and they gave Marlene 20 years in prison and Martinez received 15 years in prison. Martinez was then released in June of 1986 and became an evangelist pastor while Marlene was released later that year in December on parole. Marlene then in October of 2015 actually ended her own life and this was five days before her 60th birthday. She was suffering from osteoporosis and she had just recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. It is believed that she ended her life because she was tired of the pain and suffering of the diseases, I guess. And Martinez has, had actually died in 1997 in a car accident. And Christian had actually died a lonely man in 1983. And he had actually moved to Krugersdorp to be close to his wife's grave so that he could visit her often. He had actually expressed remorse from ever meeting Marlene to begin with. So after her trial, there was actually a clause that was released called the Marlene Lenberg Clause. And this prevented any convicted criminal from profiting off of their crimes because they found out that she was actually trying to write a book and sell it about everything that had happened. And she was planning on making a lot of money. 
and that is pretty much what happened with the case of Marlene and her love affair with Christian. So what I noticed here is that she was a very manipulative woman. It probably came with how smart she was. Because she was so smart, she was able to manipulate someone like Martinez, who already had disabilities mentally and physically, into helping her commit a crime that he probably didn't want to do, which was proven by the fact that he attempted, I guess, to do this three times before she ended up having to go with him to practically force him to commit this crime, which is really evil if you ask me. But anyway, I guess, I don't know, justice was, justice was served and then it wasn't served because they were released not even... 20 years or less after their crimes were committed but i guess they probably live pretty miserable because how do you live knowing that you murdered someone i'm sure it haunts you all your life but anyway that is the case i really hope that you guys enjoyed this video and if you did please don't forget to like subscribe and join the family and i really hope to see you guys again next time and thank you guys so much for watching Bye.